Hello, my name is Laura Johnson. I'm the Scientific Associate Director at the Flow Corps at UChicago. This is the fifth and final video in my Flow Basics 2.0 series. The first two videos, I talked about the staining protocol, how to optimize it. The second two videos, I talked about how you would actually plan out your experiment. So how you would plan your panel and choose the controls for your experiment. In this final video, I'm going to talk about the things that you should be thinking about while you're actually sitting at the cytometer and running your samples. So the workflow for the hands-on component of your experiment, you're going to start out in your lab and get a single cell suspension and stain your cells. So this is what we talked about in the first two videos. Then you will come to the flow core and at the cytometer you'll have to create your experiment layout You'll have to make a decision on what flow rate you want to run your samples at. You'll need to set the voltages for the forward and side scatter as well as the floor force. And then you'll also need to decide if you want to compensate your data on the instrument or if you want to do that afterwards on um, analysis software. Once you have that all set up, then you can go ahead and run your samples and your controls. And then you can head back to your lab and analyze your data with Flojo or FCS Express or whichever application you feel comfortable with. So in this video, I'm going to talk about all of these um, components of running your samples on the cytometer. Starting out with organizing your layout. Now I know that organizing the experiment layout can be tedious. A lot of people like to skip it because they don't have a lot of time on the instrument and they feel rushed. But hopefully I will convince you that it is absolutely worth your time to organize your um, experiment layout. The main reason is it's going to make your data analysis much, much easier. Um, the thing about flow cytometry experiments or research in general is most likely you're going to be coming back to these files several months from now or maybe even years from now when you actually go to create your manuscript, compile figures. Um, you're most likely going to be taking a look at the data um, a long time from when you actually run your samples. So if you have spent the time to organize your experiment layout and you have additional information that's packaged within your FCS files, it's going to be so much easier to figure out what you did. Um, and especially it's going to make your PI very happy, especially if you leave the lab and somebody else has to look at your data. Um, you'll definitely want to make sure that it's clear from the files themselves so that they don't have to go digging through a messy lab notebook that you have a bunch of shorthand information um, scribbled in, in it. Um, so just put it in the file. The type of information I'm talking about, mainly the one you absolutely want to include is your basically your panel. Um, so the pairing of the marker and the fluorophore, you should definitely include that for every single experiment. You might also want to include some identification information like a mouse ID, patient ID, mouse genotype, if you treated your cells, if you have a tissue, um, that information can really be easily added to the file names. So for file names, I'm going to go over how BD Faxiva structures their software. It's probably the most common software in our facility, although there are a few instruments with slightly different software. Um, but I think a lot of the software kind of follows this format. So when you open BD Faxtiva, you'll see this. We have three components. We have the experiment, the specimen, and the tube. The experiment is basically a folder that's going to contain all of your FCS files. And then the specimen and the tube will be combined to generate the file names. So for the experiment, we do recommend including your name or initials followed by the date. You can certainly include any other sort of information in the file name, but at minimum, you're going to want to um, include name and date. Then your FCS files, if they're named specimen1 and tube1 by default, the file name will be specimen1 underscore tube1.fcs, and the second tube within that would be specimen one underscore tube two dot FCS. So we recommend labeling the specimen, which is the little syringe icon. Um, name that as something generic. So it could be sample or control, single stain, FML. 
um, just something that describes all of the tubes within the group. Could be the tissue type, or if you don't have anything, I usually just put the date. There's also a few shortcuts, because I know you don't want to spend forever typing out every single tube. So in order to utilize the software to cut down on your typing, I have two tricks for you. So the first one has to do with numbered samples. So let's say you have five control tubes labeled PBS1 to PBS5. The trick is to use the next tube button, which will automatically add underscores and then a number to the file name. So if you label your first tube as PBS underscore 001, then all you have to do is click the next tube four times and it's going to automatically generate the next two, next four tubes up to PBS5. Um, and it basically will keep all of the text before the underscore. So you can put whatever you want and then as long as it ends in underscore 005, then it will use that to um, count the tubes. You can you don't necessarily have to start at one. You can start at any number as long as it's underscore and then three numbers. That's the format it uses. So if you start with mouse underscore 479, click next tube, you'll get mouse underscore 480. The next tr trick has to do with um, the groups. So let's say you have two sets of samples. The tubes are labeled exactly the same, but one set of tubes is unstimulated and the second set of tubes is stimulated. So for this, you just use this specimen as a group. So you will change the specimen first to be unstimulated and within that unstimulated group, you will create all of the tubes. Let's say you had five tubes within that group and label all five of those tubes. And once you're done labeling that, then you'll just right click on the unstimulated specimen. Um, you can duplicate it or copy paste, I think is also an option. Uh, and then it will generate the exact same thing and you just need to change the name of the specimen to stimulated instead of unstimulated. And now you have two groups that contain the same tubes with the same labels and you have your set of unstimulated and your set of stimulated. And you don't have to type everything twice. For the fluorophores, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you've selected all of the fluorophores in your experiment. By default, the experiment will have all of the detectors listed, but we generally don't recommend including all of the detectors. It kind of makes things messy. It makes your file sizes a lot larger. Um, so if you are only doing a five color experiment, then you would obviously want to keep four and side scatter, but then just keep five of the fluorophore detectors based on whatever your panel is. So you can just select all the extra ones and delete them. Um, if you accidentally delete too many, you can always add them back in, or these are, um, if you select the names, they're drop down menus. Uh, and as long as you haven't recorded anything, you can add and remove detectors. The trick is that once you have recorded your samples, you will not be able to add in detectors. So just make sure you don't accidentally delete something that you meant to include, because once you have recorded your sample, there's no way to get that data back because you never recorded anything. So just be careful, um, but we do recommend getting rid of the extra detectors. Once you have selected your fluorophores, then we strongly recommend labeling them. So by default, we have our detectors labeled like this. So that if you open up in Flojo, you'll see the laser and filter and then a generic fluorophore. You can then add your markers for your specific experiment and they will show up in Flojo like this. So the way to do that there's a few different ways in the software, um, but the way that I personally prefer to do that is to use the experiment layout window, which can be accessed from the experiment menu. Um, and it will open up like this. And once you have all of your tubes, um, you will see the options for labels here. So all you wanna do is select your column um, that you want to label, and then you can just type the label, whatever it is, like CD45 or CD3, um, into this box here and it will apply the label to the entire column. 
The experiment layout also has a few other options. So there's an acquisition tab. And in this tab, you can adjust the events to record stopping gate, stopping time, if you want to do it per tube. You can also do it um, as you're running the samples. You don't have to use this tab, but it's available if you want to fiddle around with it. There's also a keywords tab. Um, to be honest, I don't use the keywords in the software, but I do want to just point out that keywords are an option. I personally feel that keywords are most useful if you're going to do analysis with an algorithm like Tisney, um, but you can also use keywords to include additional information about your experiment. Uh, so whatever you can imagine adding, you can add that as a keyword. Uh, but generally, the most obvious things to add would be if you have patient samples, you can include clinical information that you might want to group your patients by. So maybe you want to group them by gender or age, treatment. Um, and in any software, you can use text or numbers um, for a keyword. So you could type out male or female. But my recommendation is if you're planning on using an algorithm, I would recommend always using an integer um, as your keyword value. So convert yes to one, two to no, um, or no to two. Uh, and then the benefit of doing that is when you actually do your analysis with your algorithms, um, it, they will show up on an axis. So if we have decided that male is going to be set as one, and I've entered in one or two for my gender keyword, then you can see that the cells show up at one or two. Now you don't have to do this on the instrument, you can do this in analysis software, so I actually did this in Flojo. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to worry about doing it on the instrument, but if you want to do it on the instrument, that is an option if you would like to take it. Once you have all of that set up, I would recommend creating an experiment template if this is something that you're going, you're going to be running repeatedly. Uh, so you can generate a template pretty easily. You just open up your experiment, you can right click it or you can do file export and export the experiment template. There's a little wizard, you just click through and name your template. Then when you want to start a new experiment using the template, then you'll just go up to the experiment menu and then select new experiment from here and that will open the window that contains the list of the templates. So if you have any questions about how to actually go about doing anything that I talked about while you're sitting at the cytometer then certainly feel free to grab any of the staff and we will help you find um, the place in the software and help you um, set up your experiment. Okay, moving on to setting voltages. Is the first thing you want to do for setting voltages is decide on if you want your side scatter to be in linear or log. It honestly doesn't matter, it's just a preference. Um, log is probably slightly more commonly used and it generally is useful if you have a variety of cell types. So you have eosinophils here which are very, very granular and lymphocytes that are not granular and you can see that the log makes sure that all of these cells are on the plot. Um, whereas in linear, they're getting cut off a little bit, but linear can be useful if you're using the side scatter to actually separate populations. Um, you get a little bit better separation on the linear scale. So it's up to you, just pick one and then make sure that it's set appropriately before you go about changing voltages. I do have a few different examples of how you might want to set your voltage. Um, basically, you just want your cells to be in the middle of the plot. So for the first panel, you can see we have a lot of cells uh, on the axis here. So this is not what we want. We're going to want to increase the forward scatter so that my cells are more in the middle of the plot. For the second plot, this looks pretty good. We've got a lot of cells in the middle, so these settings look great. For the third panel, we have definitely populations of cells that are on scale, basically in the middle of the plot. But this one is actually a bit of a trick. So I know that this is lung tissue. Lung tissue is actually quite hard to set. And usually digested tissue can be a bit challenging to set because there's a lot of debris. Um, and it's kind of hard to figure out what's going on. 
I've got a lot of experience running lung tissue and I personally know that this is where my lymphocytes are. Now, if my panel was only looking at lymphocytes, then these settings for Ford and Size Scatter would be just fine. But if I was interested in looking at granulocytes in my panel, then my granulocytes are all the way up here. They're being cut off. And so this is not a good setting if I'm trying to look at granulocytes. What I've actually done is in panel six is the same tissue type with different settings. So these lymphocytes here um, are actually these, what this red population is down here. So you can see I've run a lot more cells in panel six and I've turned down the forward and side scatter quite a bit. So you can see now here are my granulocytes and here are my lymphocytes. So with these settings, I'm getting all of the cells within the tissue that you can see I still have quite a bit of debris. Um, it's up on the edges here, but in here I'm losing out on some of my larger cells. So just know that you might have to gain some experience with knowing what your tissue type is supposed to look like. Um, you might need to play around with the forward and side scatter settings as you become more comfortable with your cells. So going back to panel four, this one isn't too bad. Um, the cells aren't quite in the center and they're a little bit squished over here. So I would probably increase the forward scatter a little bit more on this. Um, and then panel five, this looks great. We have a nice clear population in the center of the plot. So I would not change anything about these settings. Now, one question I've gotten is, can you change voltages between the samples? Specifically for the forward and side scatter, it is possible to change them between the samples, but ideally you want to keep all of the instrument settings exactly the same for each of the samples. So within one experiment, all instrument settings should be exactly the same. But I do have a few options. So like I said, the first option is to run everything on the same voltages. The second option, let's say maybe you have compensation beads and you have cells. You could potentially have one forward and side scatter settings for your beads and then a different setting for your cells. So as long as all of the cells are run on the same setting, all of the beads are run on the same setting, then that is acceptable to do. You can also maybe have two different tissue types. So one tissue is run with one setting, the second tissue is run with a separate setting. As long as everything that is the same tissue is run on the same settings, then that is allowed. What you don't want to do is just randomly change forward and side scatter settings for no reason whatsoever. If you're going to change the forward and side scatter setting, there needs to be a very logical reason as to why you're changing it. Um, and, you know, beads and cells can be very different sizes. Sometimes tissue set, tissue types need different settings for forward and side scatter. Um, so these are allowed. Now, this is different than your voltages for the floor four detectors you absolutely do not want to be changing those between your samples. So within an experiment, your voltages for the floor fours need to be exactly the same on every single tube within that experiment. If you change the floor four detector voltages, then you're going to have problems with your experiment. Now, in order to set the voltages, they can, for the floor four detectors. They can be a little bit challenging to set, but luckily we have taken the time to optimize them on our four tests for you. So it hopefully won't take you as long as if you didn't have the optimized voltages. So if you want to read more about the um, what we actually did to optimize the voltages, I do have a blog post on our website about all the steps that we took. Um, but in our, there's a default experiment that has our recommended starting voltages um, for each of the floor four detectors. Now, what you would want to do is run your controls at the optimized values and make sure that all of your data is on scale. So if, you're, if you run your controls at R optimized voltages and find that your control looks something like this, it's off scale, then we recommend definitely turning down the voltage until it's on scale. 
if your data looks like this, um, so at our optimized voltages, you're not seeing very good resolution between your positive and negative population. You can certainly try increasing the voltage, but in general, it's probably not going to be very useful because as you increase the voltage beyond the optimized voltage, you're just going to get extra noise in the negative population. Um, so if you're running into the problem where you're not getting resolution, good resolution of your populations, it's not a voltage problem. It's most likely a panel design problem. So you're going to want to make sure you have good panel design and titrated antibodies. And that is going to be a better solution for low resolution than fiddling around with the voltages. Um, so what you would want to do most likely would be to switch the marker to a brighter fluorophore and that will get you much better results in terms of better re resolution as opposed to increasing voltage. And there's probably a few rare cases where increasing the voltage is going to be beneficial, but for the most part, it's probably not going to be that good of a solution. I have a few examples for um, voltage settings on fluorophore. So on the top I have dot plots, on the bottom I have the same exact plot as histograms. Uh, so on this one you can see there are a lot of cells on the axis here and that is pretty obvious with the histogram. So this is definitely too bright, you definitely need to turn the voltage down for this BV421 detector. For the second plot, the cells are on scale more so than the first plot, but they're still right up at the edge. Um, I would not recommend using this setting. I would still turn it down lower because this is a little bit too close to the edge for my preferences. Um, panel three, this looks pretty good. This is probably about the brightest I would want to see your cells, so at least a little bit of a gap between the, your brightest cells and the edge of the plot. Um, I do want to point out that you can see in the histogram it's really hard to see where your positive cells are because they're such a rare population. So histograms can be useful to see if things are on the axis, um, but sometimes if there's rare populations it's going to be really hard to see the data in histograms. So oftentimes dot plots are much more useful. For this last one, um, assuming that these were run on our optimized voltage, then you know, we're getting some separation between the positive and negative cells, but we might be able to improve the separation if we move this marker to a brighter marker or fluorophore. So APC Psi 7 is kind of a dim fluorophore. Um, so if we move this from APC Psi 7 to PE, then we're going to see much better settings or resolution. Now sometimes I have people come to me saying that their data doesn't look very good and the compensation is all wrong and can they salvage the data and I tell them well it looks like the problem with your data is that your voltages were set incorrectly. They say can I still use the files that I have? Unfortunately no. If you need to change the voltages to fix your data you can't change them after you've generated the files. So the, in, the voltage is an instrument setting and once it is set, once the data is recorded, it can't be changed. You can't go back and fix voltage. The reason why people get confused is because they pair voltage with compensation and compensation can be changed after recording the data. So compensation is math. You can change the math on the compensation whenever you want. Um, you can change it on the instrument, you can change it in analysis software, it doesn't matter. Voltage is an instrument setting, so once that voltage is set, there is no way going back. Um, so if you find that your data doesn't look good, and the reason why your data doesn't look good is because the voltages were set incorrectly, then the only way to fix them is to run the entire experiment again, or if you have the same tubes, I mean, maybe you put them in the fridge, you could come back and run those tubes again if you have some sample left with new voltages. And you might be wondering, how do you know if your voltage settings are correct? The easiest way is to analyze it. So compensate the data, check your compensation, get your sample. Can you 
find the populations that you were expecting to find if you can't um, if assuming that your compensation is correct if you still can't um, find your populations then it's probably a voltage problem I do have a trick I guess that I learned when I was learning flow cytometry um, basically what you want to do is make sure that the signal is for your single stain controls um, the signal should be brightest in the detector that is assigned to that single stain so here I have a single stain for Percy PSI 5.5 so this is the detector that's been assigned to Percy PSI 5.5, and then I show you three other detectors that I had on the instrument. Um, so this is the main signal, and then anything showing up in any other detector is spillover. And we want to make sure that the signal in the assigned detector has the brightest intensity. So in the Percy P detector, Percy PSI 5.5 detector, the intensity is at 10 to the 4. The FITSI detector, we don't have any spillover, so that's fine. In the BV650 detector, it is less than 10 to the 4. In APC Psi 7, it is less than 10 to the 4. So as long as all the spillover is less than the intensity in the assigned detector, then you should be able to successfully calculate your compensation without any issue. Just want to make a quick note about the fluidics and troubleshooting any issues with the fluidics on the instrument. When you are running your sample, you have a choice in flow rate or flow pressure. So on the four TESAs, there's three buttons on the instrument, low, medium, high. Um, you should ideally always be running at low. You're going to get the best data if you run at low. The reason for that is basically what the low, medium, high settings are doing. Um, so at low pressure, uh, the core stream is at the narrowest, which means that the cells are lined up single file, and when they hit the laser at the interrogation point, they're essentially hitting a sweet spot. Um, and as you increase the pressure, so if you switch that instrument over to high, then all that does is increase the width of the core stream, which means that your cells don't necessarily end up in a single file line. They don't necessarily hit the sweet spot. Um, so that ends up translating over here to what your data looks like. You get a lot more variability in your signal. So you can see it looks really nice and clean at low, and as you increase the pressure, you're seeing more noise. So ideally you want to run it low, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to be really slow. If you want to increase the speed, really the best way to increase speed is to increase the concentration of your sample. So the best setup is to bring highly concentrated samples and run it low. If you find that you're too fast, then you can always dilute your sample while you're sitting there. You can certainly concentrate it, but it's obviously a little bit more challenging to concentrate your samples, especially when you have a lot of them. Since we're talking about flow rate, I also want to point out that you should check the time parameter on your samples. Um, this is a nice thing to check and make sure that your um, fluidics were good as you were running your sample. So across time, on any parameter, you would expect to, the signal to be very stable. Um, so just check your samples and make sure that you have a stable signal over time. If you're seeing any sort of issues, this is a pretty extreme one, um, that could indicate issues with the fluidics. So probably what happened here is I got a clog in my sample and I didn't notice and eventually the instrument pushed the clog through and then started running again on its own. Um, sometimes you won't see it take this long, you might just see a little blip in the signal, but if you find any um, anything that doesn't look steady on the time parameter, then you probably had some issues with the fluidics. Finally, I'm going to talk about compensation. So just a little reminder about compensation. Um, it is essentially mathematically correcting spillover into detectors that are not picking up the um, main signal. 
So here we have the AF700 detector, which picks up most of the AF700 signal in red, and my APC still spills over into this. So compensation is going to adjust this spillover so that I don't have to worry about it. For data, it's going to look something like this. So uncompensated, my APC signal is spilling into AF700. Um, if we apply compensation to that, starting out, our data is going to be undercompensated. And as we increase the compensation value, eventually the data will be compensated. So we can draw a straight line between the MFI of the positive and negative populations. If we keep on adding more compensation on top of that, eventually we'll end up as undercompensated, overcompensated. So if it if the population moves to the right, it's undercompensated. If it's to the left, then it's overcompensated. There's a few different ways to calculate compensation. Uh, on the software, on Faxdiva, you can calculate compensation, or you can save it for later, do it post acquisition on any analysis software. They usually offer compensation um, tools. You can also do compensation automatically um, and you can do it yourself. You can manually adjust the compensation and both automated and manual tools are available on all of the software. There's kind of a debate as to which is best. Um, I don't think it necessarily matters if you do it pre-acquisition or post-acquisition. In general, automated compensation is thought to be the best method for compensation, although you do need to know how to use the automated tools correctly. So I'm going to show you hopefully how to correctly use the automated tools. Uh, if you are be beginning at flow cytometry and you feel a bit overwhelmed by all of the different things you need to think about, my suggestion would be to use the automated tool on the instrument itself. Um, the reason for that is in BD Faxdiva, if you set voltages incorrectly um, and have a lot of spillover in detectors um, that would cause the compensation to be extremely high, you will get an error message. Um, and if you get that error message saying that there's over 100% spillover in a certain detector, um, then that would probably indicate that you should go back and adjust your voltages, rerun your samples, and redo the compensation. As you become more comfortable with flow cytometry, I would recommend kind of moving away from the Faxdiva compensation wizard because it's not as flexible as the analysis software tools. So my preference is to use the automated tools in Flojo, um, which is what I'm going to show you on the next slide. But doing it on Faxdiva can be really nice um, if, if you're not the most comfortable setting voltages, you'll get an error message. So for beginners, I really like that feature. You should also know how to perform manual compensation. Um, really, you should know how to do everything. So to use the automated compensation tools, this is Flojo's tool, um, but it's very similar in Faxiva. You will basically be setting a gate on your positive cells and on your negative cells. So in this plot, I'm only showing the positive cells, but you also have to set one for the negative cells. This is the same plot, and I have drawn four different gates on the same plot. So I want to show you how to properly set your gates to get the best compensation from these automated tools. So the first gate I set is on the most positive of the positive. The second gate I set is basically what I would call the whole bright positive population. The third gate is all of the cells that I would gate as positive if I were actually analyzing the data. And the fourth gate is just gating on the dim population of cells and ignoring the bright population of cells. And these are the results. So if I gate on the most positive of the positive, then I get the best results. If I move that gate down a little bit to include all of the bright population, you can see I actually have some 
very minor errors. So these two plots look slightly undercompensated if you compare them to these two plots up here. Then as I move this down, um, you can see that I'm seeing errors again, so much larger errors. This one is quite problematic. And the reason why I'm seeing these errors can actually be explained by the rules for compensation controls. Remember the first rule is that the positive population of the control must be as bright or brighter than the multicolor sample. Now what the algorithm or the automated calculation is doing is calculating the MFI of the gate that you set and aligning that MFI to the MFI of the negative gate that you set. So I set the gate here and this dotted line Flojo is telling me this is the MFI that it's using versus in this plot down here you can see I have a very different MFI that Flojo is using to calculate the compensation. That's why I'm getting very different results. And in this scenario, it's basically ignoring all these brighter cells. So in this case, I'm essentially breaking the first rule where my control, the thing that I'm using to calculate the compensation, is not brighter, it's dimmer, than the um, sample, which actually is technically the same tube. But in this case, this is the control and this is the sample. Um, so because my control is essentially dimmer than my sample, I'm getting errors. And the reason why this one works so well is that this MFI is as bright or brighter than my control. So you want to set your gates on the most positive of your positive cells to ensure that your control is as bright or brighter than your um, sample. That's basically what I've explained here. The other thing to know about the automated compensation tools is you need to make sure you have sufficient events. So for Flojo, you need to have at least 100 events in your positive gate and in your negative gate. So if you don't have 100 events, then you won't be able to click the calculate button. Now the protocol essentially for using compensation was would be you use the automated compensation tool. And then hopefully, as I've showed you, please don't assume that just because you've automatically calculated compensation that it's going to perfectly compensate your sample. Um, so I would check your compensation by creating n by n plots. The ones that I've set up, each row is a single stain control. So for each row, I put the y-axis as whatever color is stained and then the x-axis is every other color in the tube. And then I can open up the compensation matrix and decide if I need to make any modifications to my compensation matrix. Ideally, you'll want to make sure that you have followed all of the compensation control rules, um, that you've set your gates on the most positive of the positive cells, and hopefully you won't need to make any modifications to the compensation matrix. But if you end up not following the rules, which again is frowned upon, um, but sometimes it happens, uh, then you would want to modify the compensation matrix. Now if you are doing manual compensation, you would basically just skip this automated tool, create your n by n plots, and then edit your blank compensation matrix. I do want to point out that you should look at multiple graphs when you are changing compensation because um, here are five graphs with the same compensation matrix. I then changed one single value in that compensation matrix, and you can see how that one single change affected four of the five plots. So make sure you have all the plots open because changing a single value can change multiple plots. You might also look at your fully stained sample to see if there are any errors. You can make an n by n plots of your fully stained sample and to identify errors, you basically, the easiest way, is to look for super negative events. So here in this plot, we have the zero right here, and then we have this population down here that is in the negative. So this is a red flag for me saying that there's probably a compensation error. This shouldn't be in the negative down here. 
Same with this one. We have some super negative events. It's not necessarily a clear population, but it has this overcompensated pattern. Um, it's not symmetrical, it's sort of a teardrop shape, and this pattern would indicate a compensation error. This one is a little bit harder to tell. Um, it's not quite as obvious. Anything in super negative is much more obvious. Here, um, if the population was round and symmetrical, then I wouldn't be concerned. But because the shape is sort of pointed and going along the diagonal in this direction, then I would be a little bit concerned that there are errors or it might be some sort of autofluorescence issue depending on what um, fluorophores I'm looking at. But this is somewhat concerning pattern here. On the flip side, this here, you can see even though this is a spreading error, but it's nice and symmetrical along the axis. So this is compensated well. This is a perfectly acceptable pattern. Now, troubleshooting your single stain controls. This is getting to be a little bit more advanced, but you might run into a scenario where you have followed all of my directions, you calculate your compensation, you check the compensation on your single stain controls, it all looks great, and then you start analyzing your data and you notice that there are some patterns that look like there's some compensation issues in your full stain. But it doesn't make sense because your single stain looks like it was compensated properly. That means there's some sort of mismatch and for some reason your compensation controls aren't compensating your sample. A few questions to look at to try to address this issue would be, are you sure that you followed all the rules for the compensation controls? You know, is your sample brighter than your control? Is that why you're having issues? Um, did you use compensation beads? So sometimes the compensation beads don't do a great job of compensating cells. So if this control was beads and this was cells, you might end up with something like that. And especially if you're using a lot of the polymer dyes, so the Brilliant Violets or the BUVs, then you want to make sure you use the Brilliant Stain Buffer, otherwise you could end up with odd things like this. Now I know there's probably at least a few of you asking, what happens if there are compensation errors? What happens if my compensation isn't perfect? Obviously you want to do your best to try to get your compensation as close to perfect as possible. But sometimes we run into issues. You thought you had good controls and when you got to the instrument they didn't turn out as expected or something went wrong with your experiment and hopefully you know now that it's not ideal but you might be trying to salvage your data because you put a lot of effort into your experiment. Um, so really the best way to save an experiment that has compensation errors is to use the FMOs. So on the top here I have the, F, the FMO for the x-axis, on the bottom I have the full stain, and then we're looking at compensate, uncompensated data looks like this, I have the fully compensated data, and then in the middle here I have this sort of partially compensated. So if my compensation is slightly off, assuming I have run FMOs for all of the colors in my tube, I could potentially use the FMO um, and gate my population properly. So, you know, I can see that if I was just looking at fully stained sample and I didn't have any controls, I would think this population in the middle here is real. But if I look at my FMO, I can tell that it is not a real population. And so I want to make sure that I don't gate on this population and think that it's a real group of cells. So, again, this is not what I recommend doing, but if you are desperate and trying to salvage your data, if you have FMOs, they can save you if you have compensation errors. And that is it for my series. Um, if you want to download the slides, then make sure you check the link in the box below and you can access our website with all of the um, PDF versions of these slides.